Good morning everyone and welcome to our November webinar and today we're going to focus on employment contracts and specifically talk about how they're key to business success. So I think it's fair to say that since the pandemic and uh, advancements in technology, gone are the days of such rigid and fixed working arrangements. So today we're going to be looking at how a more modern way of working um, needs to be supported by legally compliant contractual paperwork that ultimately underpins a more flexible and modern employment relationship. So before we get going, I want to do the normal introductions. And so I'm Victoria Templeton, HR Knowledge Manager at HR Solutions, and I'm joined uh, by Sue Watson, Operations Director, with uh, Rebecca Johnson, Marketing Manager, supporting as well. And because we've got so many of you who have joined us today, we've put you all on mute. However, as always, we do like to hear your questions. So when you see this slide, it means we're at the end of the webinar and we can take your live questions. So I'm just going to show you how you can do that. So on your screen now, you should see an image of what your GoToWebinar panel screen looks like. Simply type in your questions and then um, submit those and we'll aim to read out and answer as many as we can at the end. And when you see this slide, it means we'll be running a confidential poll in which we seek your input that will help um, in the running of the webinar today. We find polls are really helpful and useful for everybody attending the webinar and watching it on demand because it gives people an insight into how other businesses are doing things and, um, and things like that. So it is really um, insightful to have everybody's contribution. So we've got many uh, polls set up for today. So as I said, when you see that slide, that means we're about to and some polls. So what we're going to look at today is first of all consider why robust, robust contracts are key to business success. We're going to look, about, look at how using the right type of contract can help to respond to changing social demographics. We'll cover at high level the importance of employment statuses and uh, because ultimately this is key to understanding what type of contract is going to be needed within the business. And then we're going to just run through some examples of how you can see that using different contracts can give you that more flexible and modern workplace. And so before we get going, we're going to run our first uh, three polls. Um, so as I said, they're confidential. Just bear in mind that if you're going to participate, you need to not be in your full screen mode on your um, system. So um, if we could have the first poll, and this is all about whether um, your business has changed the way in which it employs people since the pandemic. Let's give that a couple more minutes. Yep. Okay, I'll close that poll and okay. share the results. I was pretty close. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, 55, 45. Yeah, and I, um, I suppose it doesn't come as a surprise, does it? Because how things have significantly changed in the way in which we work. Yeah, for some are um, already working quite flexibly, I guess. And, yeah. Um, and some um, they've had to adapt. So, yeah, it's probably about right. So Thank I'll... you for that. And our second poll is whether the business have adopted more flexible working practices since the pandemic. I guess the key things there since the pandemic, because everybody had to yeah. during. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think most people have voted, so I will close that and share those results. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, so that's staggering 82%. Mm. Um, and that might be because um, of business need or actually recognising that it probably aligns with, um, I guess, what will come on to people's um, the social aspect of it in terms of uh, personal requirements people have from balancing work and, and home life. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that's quite um, an interesting statistic. Thank you. And we have one more. One more in this section. In this yep. section, yeah. There you go. And it's about your contracts and whether they reflect these changes.
There we go. I will close that poll and share those results. Okay. So and another there we go. close one. So 44% mm. um, have reflected the changes, 56% no. And I think what we'll come on to talk about next is, um, I guess, the purpose and why it's important to have robust contracts. So uh, there'll be things to take away from that section for the 56% of you and those that have then um, it's a good opportunity to just, I guess, check in with the, um, it's all um, aligned with what needs to be required. So mm -hmm. thank okay. you. Okay, so um, in terms of uh, robust contracts and why they're key to success, um, really contra contracts actually have a significant impact on a business's operations and ultimate success. The contract plays that crucial role in defining the uh, relationship between an employer and an employee. And as we'll see um, later, uh, we'll talk about those relationships and how they can differ depending on the needs of the business. But in recent years, we have seen a significant shift in the way in which people are employed and the polls support that, that we've just run. And there are more modern ways of operating that have come out on the back of the pandemic. And as I said earlier as well, because of changing technologies. Um, but I think it's widely recognised that uh, business operations and the employment of people can still be more flexible, benefiting not just the individual, but the business. Um, and so as businesses modernise, so must our employment practices and in particular, obviously, the way in which we employ people. So using the right type of contract of employment can not only help employers attract the best talent, but they can also help with employee retention as well, which we know still continues to be one of the big challenges for many businesses. So um, let's look at the importance of having robust employment contracts. And I think the first thing to say is around the legal compliance. You know, your contract serves as a legal document outlining terms and conditions of employment, ensuring both parties adhere to applicable employment laws and regulations. So it ultimately helps businesses to avoid potential legal disputes and financial penalties that come about from those and uh, from non-compliance. We then have an element of risk management, which uh, obviously links closely with your legal compliance. So employment contracts help mitigate risks that are associated with um, employee behaviours, such as discrimination, harassment, and ethical conduct, um, and it establishes those clear guidelines and expectations, and therefore allowing those businesses can uh, minimise potential list, uh, legal risks and reputational damage. They're also important because it's, it means that you're able to communicate clearly uh, your expectations and uh, define roles and what's expected from both parties. So everybody understands the duties and expectations, and ultimately it can help lead to improved productivity, efficiency, and overall job satisfaction if you've got um, a robust contract of employment in place that provides that clarity for the individual. They are also important because from a business perspective, there's clearly a need to protect intellectual property and confidentiality. So employment contracts often include provisions that protect the business's uh, intellectual property, trade secrets, inventions, and of course, the confidential um, nature of the information that people deal with as part of their employment. So it's safeguarding the company's competitive, um, competitiveness and prevents unauthorized disclosure. So employment contracts can establish uh, confidential, uh, confidentiality obligations, restricting employees from sharing sensitive information about the company, its clients or strategies. So it's obviously going to be there to protect uh, the reputation and prevents uh, potential harm um, from disclosures. From a performance management perspective, your contract of employment is also essential. As I said a moment ago, your contract is about setting expectations and standards. So that robust contract will serve as a foundation for um, effectively managing somebody's performance, um, in, uh, allowing employees to set clear performance expectations. And ultimately, um, if it comes to terminating somebody's contract on the grounds of capability, then um, you've got um, the legal protections in your contract that supports that process. 
and dispute resolution. Now, unfortunately, there will always be disputes in the employment relationship at some time or another um, in many cases. And so that robust contract needs to uh, and must include uh, dispute resolution clauses, so it outlines a process for addressing grievances and disciplinary matters um, so, so that the employee is very clear in terms of, again, setting the standards and the expectations, but know how um, disputes can be resolved within the workplace. We also um, believe that having those robust contracts can lead to improved employee morale and productivity. Um, having the right contract offered to an applicant can actually help you to tackle the current recruitment and retention challenges that uh, many businesses are still facing um, and therefore enhance employee engagement. So if you're able to offer a more flexible contract um, and somebody that you're, um, you know, that's wanting to join your organisation has many different um, conflicts outside of work that need to juggle and responsibilities, then being able to use the right contract in terms of offering them employment can help um, address the recruitment retention challenges and um, help have that engaged workforce. Contracts don't have to be the typical Monday to Friday, nine to five, open-ended contract, permanent contract. There are many ways in which we're gonna cover about how you can recruit flex uh, flexibly and uh, ultimately help boost your employee morale and productivity. And um, similarly, talent attraction and retention is obviously very contract that offers fair compensation, um, benefits, working conditions, they all go towards helping to attract um, a, you know, good talent into your organisation and retain your top talent. And so again, that um, contributes to having that more engaged and productive workforce. When it comes to terminating employment, uh, robust contracts are vital because it provides or can provide those clear clauses on how you handle employee termination. So, for example, um, if you're in a situation where you need to um, enforce garden leave, then obviously having that uh, well-written uh, contractual clause in there about that helps support you to facilitate that action or payment in lieu of notice, obviously having the authority to provide that to employees on leaving employment. You know, these are key clauses. So um, having that robust contract of employment helps in the management of the termination of the employment contract. And we'll come on to those again um, later on in the webinar. So if we think about changing social demographics, we're just going to, um, before that, run a couple of quick polls. And it's really about um, your current contracts you have in your place at the moment. So, first of all, when did you last review your contract template? Now, was it before um, the pandemic, since the pandemic? So, roughly we're saying 22 onwards, or you haven't at all? Okay, I'll close those. Yeah. Share the results. There you go. Okay. So, 53%, uh, that's a um, relatively high figure actually since the pandemic mm. um, reflects, I guess, the earlier polls about how um, your employment practices have changed since the pandemic. 38% uh, before the pandemic and 9% um, of you haven't reviewed updated uh, template contracts. So as we go through today, there'll be some things that you can hopefully take away to help um, just sense check um, what your contracts are like in your workplace and if you feel that they provide you with uh, the sufficient flexibility um, to suit the, the current um, working environment. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on those numbers, Sue? Um. No, so we had the um, good work plan changes in, was it 2020, yeah. I think. So um, it's interesting because, uh, you know, a number of people will have changed or updated their templates um, following those because there were some more requirements to include, weren't there? Yeah. Um, 
so and people were waiting i think for quite a while for this to be released um yeah. before they did a massive review so um but yeah it's interesting um yeah i think um there's it depends as well i guess as to how flexible your existing contracts were um you know people some people were already working quite flexibly um using flexi time or having um more flexible contractual arrangements um mm. with staff maybe already depending on the type of industry they were in i think it's it's the impact on industries that haven't traditionally offered those flexibilities um yeah. they've had to really consider um more seriously how they can make it work mm. um if they want to keep you know their key staff as well so um and, and we've had a difficult recruitment climate haven't we as well yeah um so so yeah i i guess that's um not surprising but also um reflective of what what we've been through yeah yeah and sometimes you know you may go through a particular situation in uh the workplace that prompts a need to look at the contract as well so you might have an actual um employee relations case that mm. there was some learnings from um or has triggered a debate as to whether something could be done or not and it's i guess a reminder of how important the contract is because it's the contract that gives you the flexibility to do some of those things and if i think about one example and i won't necessarily go into detail because that's probably for another webinar but the whole um suspension and sick pay and what pay mm -hmm. do people ssp or full pay you know that those sort of things that come through from everyday queries that crop up in the workplace um often generate the need to think about actually let's look back at our contract is it serving us as we need it to in these events that may occur mm -hmm. so um we'd always recommend obviously uh, regularly reviewing your contracts to make sure they're fit for purpose not necessarily from a obviously from a legal point of view but does it work for you as a business or operationally so mm -hmm. um but yeah interesting thank you and then we've got just one more poll in this section and it's about whether any of the following um, are included in your contracts of employment so things like your garden leave clause payment in lieu of notice uh, deduction from wages confidentiality and any clauses to protect your property or holding second employment other employment Shall yeah. I close the vote now? Yeah. And share those results. Okay. High figures. And confidentiality mm. being the one that um, is mostly used. That's good to see. And um, I guess it's probably a good opportunity to just sort of reiterate why uh, you'd want to have these in the, the work, uh, the contract. And like I was saying a moment ago, if you've not got a clause in your in your contract that talks about garden leave then it's difficult to impose that you have to go through getting somebody's agreement to do it so it's just about how it can alter how you manage a situation and facilitate something happening whether you've got the power and authority to do so um, similarly with payment in lieu of notice that needs to be in your contract if you want to be able to be offering payment in lieu in any situation in the future um now in reality most people would want to pay the garden leave i suspect or may be happy to take that payment in lieu of rather than working notice but um nevertheless it's still important to have it in your in the contract and the deduction for wages that comes up quite a lot actually as queries doesn't it um mm -hmm. as i yeah. know um it's amazing actually uh, the challenges that can come from that if you've not got a, a well-written clause around how you manage deduction from wages and what you are allowed to deduct when people leave mm. or during employment and that that's quite a key uh, contractual clause i'd say absolutely yeah um because often if you can make the deduction and 
think I've got a deduction clause, it's fine, make the deduction on leaving, and then you realise that you hadn't actually covered, for example, re repaying a training um, for a training course and you hadn't actually put a training agreement in place either, you know, that, that mm. regularly crops up. So um, it's just making sure it's, it does encompass everything you might need to deduct for in your particular business case. Yeah. So, Thank you. Okay, I'll that one. No, you don't. Thank so you. we're going to talk about the changing social demographics because uh, that's also important because it has evolved in um, recent years. And as I've said um, earlier, you know we have seen advancements in technology. Businesses have been able to support changes in um, social demographics as a result. You know we know more and more people are taking on caring responsibilities. Um, whether that's family, uh, raising a young family, becoming carers for elderly parents or disabled family members. And people are also wanting to change the way in which they work to support perhaps health issues uh, that they may be uh, suffering from or for their general well-being and to get that uh, work-life balance. And we're going to go through some research that um, has been collected by the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development um, in the May 2023 report, Flexible and Hybrid Working Practices, it reports that 40% of employers have seen an increase in flexible working requests following the pandemic. And of course, we will have some changes to our flexible working laws um, in due course. 66% of employers believe it's important to provide flexible working as an option when recruiting. And 39% are more likely to approve flexible working other than um, uh, from working from home and 39% of employers already offer flexible working as a day one right. Um, so and that's one of the potential changes that, um, that could come up although it's not been passed in the latest um, employment bill that was given um, uh, Royal Assent. So um, there were some interesting statistics about the changing social demographics in terms of what people are wanting from work and their employment and the report also tells us that the most common type of flexible working was working from home with 37 percent of respondents and 46 percent of employees would want a four-day working week and we have run a webinar on four-day working week earlier this year which you can access the recording on our website if anybody wants to uh, look back at that and we talk through three or four different case studies from real examples and actually, there's many, many benefits for um, a potential four day working week. Clearly, it doesn't work in all setups, organizations or with all job roles. But there is certainly a more viable way of operating a four day working week um, compared to, you know, a few years back. So that is an area where um, it's on employees uh, radar, I guess, because there's also been a lot of publicity. And then 39% of employees would also want flexi time. So I think what we're seeing, and I think the pandemic showed us that A, we can uh, generally, employers and businesses can support flexible working and the, uh, you know, more um, non-standard working like your Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of thing. They can uh, be flexing in the way in which they bring people in into the organization and actually, um, we know that people are getting more um, more and more responsibilities outside of work, as I said, through caring responsibilities and other demands, and people are simply wanting a more flexible and balanced work life. So when we think about contracts of employment and uh, resources that are needed, um, a really important consideration is the employment status of the job holder because doing so can be invaluable in terms of cost efficiency and flexibility, and I'll come on to explain why. So there are three types of employment status. You've got your employee, worker, and self-employed. Um, the first two, employee and worker, have a legal definition under the Employment Rights Act. There's no legal definition of what constitutes self-employed, but there are a number of factors that we can be guided by through case rulings and HMRC, for example, of what would constitute self-employed. But in recent years, the dividing line between these has become increasingly blurred. And it's really important that you can distinguish between these different employment statuses and manage the relationship in line with the relevant rights and protections that are associated with each. You know, so 
for example, you know, the legal protections do differ between each status. So employees have far greater work, uh, working rights than workers. And clearly there were tax implications and responsibilities from an IR35 perspective when you're dealing with those who are self-employed contracting. So it's really important to be able to distinguish between those types of uh, employment. And using the correct type of contract employment status can provide the greatest flexibility in managing your resource um, and therefore the contractual documents that you need for each of these. So it's a really important area. And so before we go on to sort of talk about more of the different statuses and how they are um, used, we're going to just run some quick polls again. And really the first one is about, first of all, do you use a variety of contracts within your organisation? So whether it's fixed term, permanent, uh, flexi, uh, hybrid. Okay, I'll close that one yep. and share the results. It's a good majority do. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay, and sure. then... Um, so really the follow-up questions, it's going to be in two parts. Um, the first part only because we're restricted to, as to how many options we can have for you to select. So the first part is of these um, ones, which ones do you um, tend to use in your organisation? Okay, I'll close that one yeah. and share that. So, yeah, so what have we got? So, yeah, open ended is typically the most prevalent one, yeah. Um, fixed term, um, annualised contract, that's good to see, 6%. Um, it is one of those that's probably the more unusual, um, but it's it so does hard, certainly, <laughs> it's hard. Um, it certainly has its benefits um, and zero hours, yeah. I expect zero hours in the past would have been a lot higher. I, I would have imagined yeah. if we'd done the poll a few years ago. Um, and even more the people using, them di using different yeah. contracts now, aren't they? And hybrid remote would have probably been a lot lower. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Interesting, I mean, we haven't asked it, but if you do operate hybrid working, remote working, do you allow working from outside the UK? But we didn't put that in as a poll. <laughs> yeah, but, um, that's another challenge. <laughs> that's an, yeah, and probably warrants its own webinar. So thank you. That's really interesting. And the second um, part to that is um, some more examples of contracts, basically. So do you also um, utilise job share contracts, term time, casual worker, and of course agency and contractors. Okay. Um, yeah. Just one more minute. There's quite a few coming through now. Okay. I will close and share those results. Yeah. Mm. Interesting in that there are job share contracts being used. I, I think they're quite a tricky one as well. Obviously, they have massive mm. benefits. Um. So it's good to see they're being used, albeit it's the lowest figure in the sponsors. Got term time. Yeah. Um I suppose, yeah, contracts and agencies, yeah, they're they're mm. common, aren't they? Regular forms of ongoing resource. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I guess that's where you need to just be mindful of or just conscious of are they truly contractors? Mm -hmm. Are they genuinely agency workers? There's no risk um, of them being an employee, a, a worker, employee versus, um, you know, what their the contractor or, or agency 
So um, interesting. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. That's good to see what you're all using. And, and then actually, one so we've we? got one more in this section, and it's around when somebody does leave your organisation, do you use it as an opportunity to review the type of contract that you want moving forward in the business? Um, so actually, you may no longer need um, an open-ended contract. You might be able to support um, zero hours annualized Okay, I'll yeah. press up well and share those results. So 36% of you do and 64% uh, yeah. don't. And I suppose it, it does present a good opportunity because if a business is at the point of, um, I don't know, it might just provide you with opportunity to become more flexible and ag agile moving forward it might present the opportunity for some cost savings by you don't no longer you no longer need perhaps somebody doing it full time but you can probably um now achieve it through some form of part time work um so it's always good opportunity to just think about what kind of uh, contract you need moving forward um and things like that so um even mm. if it doesn't change and you carry on recruiting like you did before it's still worth just sense checking because things can change um in the organization and externally of course mm, absolutely okay there you go okay, thank you i think they may be all the polls <laughs> so um what i'm going to just show you here is um the differences between employee work and self-employed and um, obviously, employee being the predominant one in any organisation, um, every employee must be given that written statement of employment particulars. That comes as a requirement under the Employment Rights Act. Both parties enter into that legal relationship where there are obligations on both sides, so would be obliged to pay you for the work that you do. You're obliged to turn up and do that work. Um, one party basically agrees to employ another as the employee um, with the other person agreeing to serve the employer as an employee essentially and that relationship is known as a contract of service and um, the individual have full employment rights which I will come on to shortly so as you can see here there's a variety of different contracts that can be used um, when recruiting somebody on an employee status basis you know uh, fixed term hybrid remote um, job share apprentices so there's many different ways in which you can bring people in and going back to that last poll it might be that when you do have somebody leave and you need to look at recruiting moving forward you know is an opportunity to think about actually can we bring an apprentice in can we develop somebody from scratch build them uh, bring them in and uh, develop them um, where you're sort of really building their knowledge and understanding around your own business molding it to your business so um yeah there are many different ways in which you can uh, employ people um and obviously then the next um status is your worker status and we've got some examples here so casual workers or workers um, are those who truly provide ad hoc work on an irregular basis so the difference between this relationship and the one I've just outlined is an organisation isn't obliged to offer work and the individual is not obliged to accept that work. Um, sometimes it can get confused with zero hour workers. And I think if you're wanting someone to commit to providing work over a year, but just not committing to a number of hours, then that's more like a zero hours contract and you've got their obligation to accept it. So they're more of an employee status. But otherwise, if it's generally as and when, we don't know how many hours or if we'll always need you, but as and when, then that is your more your casual worker. So um, it can get a little bit confusing and technical, but I think if you can just um, bear in mind the 
nature of the relationship is as and when and there's that uh, you're not um, obliging them to accept any work that you offer and neither are they obliged to um, you're not obliged to offer and they're not obliged to accept and then um, you could have an intern so almost like a work experience so interns can be paid or unpaid volunteer um, so they can be uh, an employee or worker it actually depends on how you write their contract and what you need them to be and as with an employee every um, so every worker should be given a written statement of employment particulars under the Employment Rights Act both parties enter into that legal relationship um, and uh, the relationship is known as contract of service but the difference here is that they'll get partial employment rights and as I said I'll come on to that in a moment so they don't get the same extent of employment protection as an employee does and um, finally the self-employed um, so somebody could be contracted on an individual basis or through a company and that type of engagement enables you to buy in the services or skills of that individual directly or as I said through a separate company they might be known as freelancers and they're responsible for their own tax and national insurances but for the organization that's buying in the services um, IR35 um, of payroll rules means that you need to be making your own assessment to determine if the engagement is deemed truly as um, a, a self-employed uh, contracting basis um, this is a very can be a challenging area of law um, in terms of um, status because employment status can have uh, there's two different ways to manage employment status so there's employment status for managing tax which is very separate to employment rights and then obviously employment status uh, with regards to all uh, employment protections so it can be a minefield um, but there is some guidance around IR35 on our knowledge base as well as government websites um, but essentially um, they are um, not providing uh, a contract of service that it's a contract for services and they don't have employment rights but as I said there's IR35 obligations and here are the differences so um, surprisingly workers do get quite a fair bit of employment rights protection so as you'll see here they're entitled to the uh, or they must get the national minimum wage in terms of the wages they have protection from unlawful deduction of wage claims um, they must receive the minimum rest breaks under the working time regulations and um, should not work more than the um, 48 hours a week on average they also have protection from unlawful discrimination um, and also protection for reporting any wrongdoing in the workplace i.e you know your whistleblowing if they're part-time and they're not to be treated less favorably and um, interestingly they may also be eligible if they qualify for statutory payments which uh, will be statutory sick pay uh, statutory maternity pay etc so that's for the worker and then the employee obviously has all of those but in addition they have um, the legal right to have minimum notice periods uh, they have protection against unfair dismissal the right to request flexible working time off statutory time off for emergencies dependency leave and then statutory redundancy pay so they're the additional uh, um, employment protections that are afforded to somebody with the employee status so it it really highlights the importance of ensuring that your um, the people that you bring in on your contracts they're on the right contract and that you're managing them in line with the correct employment status and I think just to sort of um, sum up some examples of how sorry it's automatically gone on to the next slide let's see that should be paused no I'll come back to that Rebecca if you're able to just take the transition off <laughs> I'll come back to that previous slide but essentially using contracts to build a flexible and modern workplace um, as I said when an employee leaves a business it's always a good opportunity to reflect on what the business needs at that point and what they're likely to need in the future as I said many things could have changed since the last uh, since the business recruited previously internally and externally um, so contracts are key to building a business that can be flexible and adapt to those challenges 
and it's also important to recognise that the role of remote and hybrid working plays in employee attraction and retention. Um, we also know from other research um, out and reported in the People Management um, magazine that hybrid and flexible working are big factors when people are looking for new employment and in the research that was published it said it found that employers who could offer remote or hybrid working were more successful at rec recruitment than those that couldn't or didn't and in fact it was found that employers were three times more likely to report finding it easier to recruit than, uh, than usual um, when compared to those employees who required staff uh, to work on site only. So there's massive benefits of looking at having more flexible um, working practices and therefore uh, some form of flexible contract. Obviously not all businesses or job roles can support it, but where it can obviously it's a great tool for attracting and retaining individuals. Um, so different contracts of employment are great when you have available workload, short-term projects, if you need to bring in a specialist skill set, um, if you're wanting and needing to address recruitment and retention challenges, um, or generally improve employee engagement. So um, if you think about available workload, and if we go back to that previous slide, let's hope it works okay. So if you think about the business relies on a certain specialist skill set, it's hard to recruit for, so actually you think about recruiting an apprentice with the aim of building that skill set internally and then developing within. And that might be a more practical, pragmatic way of getting a particular skill set. Clearly there's a time frame because it's not an instant skill, but it's about um, succession planning and um, equipping uh, people uh, with the right skills once they're in the workplace. It could be that the business has three peak periods during the year. Uh, the remaining months being fairly quiet and therefore you look to recruit someone on an annualised hours contract to reflect resource levels wavering throughout uh, the year and that might be more a cost effective and efficient way of um, recruiting um, for a role. Or you need to find cover for someone's adoption leave and you recruit on a fixed term contract basis. That's obviously very straightforward and clearly there's the expectation on both parts that it is only for a defined period of time and um, when that person returns to work then obviously um, that individual then that fixed term contract comes to an end. Or it could be you've been using agency staff throughout the summer but it's proved costly and um, it perhaps makes more sense to commit to employing individuals on fixed term contracts. The business relies on certain um, specialist skills uh, that are also hard to recruit for, so you also decide to recruit for apprentice with the aim of building skill set internally, like I've said. So there's um, looking at how you use agency, because the agency staff are costly, um, it might be that it's a more appropriate way of recruiting the resource through having some form of uh, short-term fixed-term contract for the needs um, when you need it. So let's go to any questions. So we're 10 to 11 um, and we'll just see what questions have come in. Okay we have one or two um, but quite linked as you might expect. Um, so if one of the questions was, um, they have a contract in place with their employees, can they be changed? So a little bit, I guess, if we talk a little bit about how you can change contracts of employment yeah. um, and the importance of having the kind of business case around the changes. Um, and it might be because you need to, you need more flexibility um, in maybe the hours or the, or the, um, the days that, that people work or you want to look at move into four day working or various other options available to you but it all starts doesn't it with the business mm. case so what is the reason for needing to make the change if the reason you're making the change is just to bring them up to date in line with employment legislation then that's an okay reason and you can um, update the contracts and kind of implement the changes with consultation but no um, you don't have to give notice of the changes or anything else you can just implement it because you're actually bringing them up to date and to make mm -hmm. them legally compliant um, which you're obliged to do anyway 
as an as a good employer so but it's if you want to make changes for business reasons that um are not necessarily legal changes or legislation changes um where it's a bit more of a process involved isn't there yeah 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 definitely um you know you'd have to go through full consultation and give full mm. contractual notice of any change and there will be risks that you'll lose people in that process so you have to mm. do it very carefully um so yeah, yeah so not, not not the light-hearted that one <laughs> no so having that robust contract in the first place having some clause, flexibility clause um helps at least in that process and then that's um, the links in with another question which yeah. is around can can i refuse to work between 9 p.m and 2 a.m <laughs> um and i guess that depends on whether the contract you were offered was included mm. those hours or whether you are now being asked to work between those hours <laughs> um that's two quite different things isn't it mm. um and i guess if 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 you've accepted a contract that included those hours then you've accepted the contract on those terms so yeah that would be difficult for you to refuse um mm -hmm. unless personal circumstances have changed and that you're unable to do it for good reason then you know talk to your employer and see what is possible mm -hmm. but if they are needing to impose those changes um because they're needing to be more flexible or for commercial reasons um then yes you can refuse but equally the employer might might need to implement those changes for good yeah. business reasons in which case um it depends on how well they conduct the process of making those changes yeah. and what options they can um, make available and whether they're willing to consider either compromises or or whether some people can indeed not work those hours yeah. if there's people who can um so that's quite a quite a difficult question to answer without knowing all the context isn't it um and it depends on how the flexible hours working hours contract is worded um yeah. normally they give business hours or between you know whatever and whatever and you will be required to work some some nights some weekends or whatever it is that the business operates in whatever, whatever operating hours they have they should have built it into the flexible contract and so you might be required to work at any time within that mm. and if you are i guess being recruited for a position um you could also always say you know can i can i um not work between those hours what would be the implications yeah um so yeah I think that's that's just a bit more difficult. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, each situation obviously um, is going to be very different in its context, isn't it? And yeah. like you said earlier, the business case is pivotal because it just underpins any process. And if an employee goes on to challenge it, then you've got your business rationale, business case to sort of explain the reason for why you're proposing or wanting somebody to work certain hours but that probably warrants another webinar <laughs> yes, said that many times today. yes this is um there's, it's quite a complex area isn't it and yeah. and implementing them and changing them and um um looking at how well i mean we've said it for other processes you know the business case is key in in making it successful you can you can do anything think you need you can make changes you can as long as there's a, a sound business commercial reason for doing it mm. um but it's and then it's making sure you follow a fair process to do it and you listen to everybody's concerns and you try and overcome those concerns um yeah. if you can um all the while think linking back to the reason why you started the process in the first place um, but it is it is quite a challenging one and, and to minimise the risk of any claims you need to do it properly and thoroughly. Um, but we have worked with many clients who've, who've done it successfully so um, it is possible to make yeah. changes. Um, one of the other, um, there's a number of observations around all of this and, and the question was around A, how you, um, how you can have a good 
kind of contract management process mm. in terms of uh, maintaining them because employment law is always changing and it's yeah. going to change a lot in the next few months it, it I'm is. sure um, and and how you um, you know amend and ch as we just discussed change contracts as your business grows um, but also um, how how we can improve um, the sort of contractual you know the more the the, the commenters says about insecure work where it's the you know the casual work i guess mm. um so i think it's um that's again we've talked about today haven't we about using uh, maybe fixed term contracts as opposed mm. to uh contractor arrangements and and agency workers and it's again it were it's commercial decision isn't it as to yeah. what does the business need and if they only need um, additional work at certain times of the year or or for particular reasons to cover a long-term absence or a particular project then you're going to need to use um, the most suitable contract and and workforce mm. um, that's available <laughs> to you so um, I think it's just making sure those decisions are, are sound again in why you're using a particular worker over another and if you're not able to offer sort of more permanent work uh, or more guaranteed work then um, making sure you minimize the amount of people employed under that kind of mm. status yeah um, so yeah I, th I think um, sort of management of contract management it's you know resource planning isn't it and I think at mm. the start of each year there's that strategic people planning activity that should be taking place where you look at all people initiatives but as part of that resourcing is one big element isn't it and how you're going to resource the business for the year ahead or the a few years ahead um and any changing needs in that resource so there's always a need for strategic people planning taking into account resources and then even depending on the business so um you know I've come from environments where there's been uh, contact center environments and so there is a real need to be resource planning on perhaps a daily basis um, because of the ever-changing needs in that kind of environment so it does depend on your business the kind of roles you employ numbers um, your attrition rates um, but there should there is always worth um, it warrants looking at your resource planning even on a monthly basis if you're not in uh, that fast-paced environment um, mm, absolutely right now when you know things are so volatile externally mm. um, yes. but well, yeah. we've got another very topical question which is um, their employees have worked one day in the office and four days at home can we make the change and ask them to return more <laughs> contract state their place of work is office not home <laughs> yeah a place of work one day in the office yeah so it, it comes back to those conversations about seeking to change somebody's hours um again it all depends on the backdrop to it how it's all come about how long they've been doing it but essentially yeah i mean um you've got to be careful obviously going into those conversations um but i think you are seeing more and more generally employers wanting people back in the workplace and those are probably going to be some difficult conversations aren't they people have ended up in that situation because of the pandemic and there was that mad rush to get <laughs> home um but actually did anything get finalized in terms of paperwork and conversations after after it or has it been silent and left to carry on it's probably one of those areas that um yeah interesting and it, and it's whether you whether you if you did recontract did you make it both home you know a hybrid clause or did you have um sort of fixed you know one day per week is office and four days at home um if that was the case and that was a, a contractual variation then to bring them back into the office more you're back mm -hmm. into negotiating over a contractual change and maybe making it a more flexible hybrid arrangement um, yeah. or and, and it's incentivizing them back into the office a lot of people want to and they're and they're wanting the social social aspects of being yeah. together um, again um, but 
equally people have got very used to working kind of on their own and some people get a lot more done <laughs> so yeah. I think it's um it it's the reasons for needing them back in is it just because yeah. you want the buzz back of people being around or is there a practical work reason for needing it you need you know there's more collaboration with teams perhaps but um and all of that messaging needs to be conveyed mm. um you know we've we've seen yeah. clients try um pizza days once a week to get people in the office and once they get in and start talking to their colleagues they're arranging follow-up meetings in the office um, and then it kind of grows from there you know you, you can start it informally and see how it goes or you can start the conversations around a more permanent um, contractual arrangement. And the, the other thing I'll just add on that question because I see that it says contract state the place of work is office not at home. Not home. Yeah. Um, things even if something is in writing mm. some, that could become outdated by what's happening in practice and in reality practice. Yeah. so yeah. in this particular question it's really understanding you need to sort of look at um, what messages and communications have been happening or taking place since that transition from office to home occurred what's the intention or what's the employee's expectation or understanding would you say from all your conversations um, is there that expectation that they have um, at some point needing to be coming back or has it just been silent like I said earlier um, but yes yeah, so just bear in mind that what's happening in practice can become a you contractual yeah. by implication isn't it yeah yeah so um, yeah and other than yes this there's some observations and comments about, you know, the fact the inequality of, of contractual rights and workers' rights across mm. internationally, not just across the country. Um, yeah, that's a that's a, a big issue and something that we're unfortunately not going to be able to solve today. But um, it's very much, you know, if every employer starts considering their workers' rights and contractual obligations um then you know we could make the uk a place to people want to work and um set the example but you know there's 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 huge challenges um internationally absolutely in making sure they're equal mm. equality in everything mm. and lots of laws changing aren't they um as we adopt all the european laws and um into our own and start our own journey <laughs> Is the UK then um, I think there's lots more to be seen yeah mm -hmm. so, okay I think that's all the questions though yep. for now yep lovely thank you so um, before we bring the webinar to a close just want to uh, let you know about our HR knowledge base um, some of you may uh, be members and have access to it um, others um, won't be familiar with it so our HR knowledge base is essentially it's an online portal it's a HR resource that um, can make it so much easier for business owners and managers to manage all their employment paperwork because we have templates um, on there all the HR documents and policies that covers the entire employment life cycle so if we think about what we've been talking today you'll find template contracts we have job share contracts annualized hours hybrid uh, term time all the contracts directors contracts uh, of course we also have cons uh, contractor agreements which are commercial agreements but we have a, agreement templates there and we have worker agreements for those that are worker by employment status so whether you're wanting to use casual workers so this portal uh, knowledge base is a great tool for having those templates and of course they are always the latest version they are always under review constant review they get changed with um, legal updates but also like I said earlier on the webinar you know if there's any learnings from anything any case law that might come in that actually get you to think actually we need a clause in a contract now that addresses that you know we are on top of that and we make sure our contracts are the latest um, um, most suitable and of course it's also um, a tool to provide you with HR articles and guides and checklists so it, again covering the whole entire life cycle we've got over 600 articles on there we've got lots of 
guides checklist. So if you're carrying out a variation <laughs> to a contract conversation, you've got a, a toolkit to help you through that. So there's so many valuable uh, templates on there available. And as I said, everything is the latest in terms of legal compliance and uh, latest HR best practice. And, you know, we provide lots of guidance on a way, wide range of topics. So um, the screenshot here is just an illustration of what it would look like. That's the home page they're showing and it gives you um, basically access to all the documents and articles. And it also lets you know what events we have coming up with our free webinars. So if you want more information, please do let us know, get in contact with us and you um, can access the website there uh, to get in touch. We also offer training courses, um, as we've got here, we offer ILM, both level three and five, and many of our uh, management training courses shown here also count towards your CPD points, so, um, uh, and they cover all, all aspects of um, employment and managing people. Uh, we obviously offer our free webinars, we've got the latest schedule now available and we're running a additional webinar at the end of this month, identifying and developing skills within your workforce. In December, uh, the hot topic and webinar is going to be looking at the HR year ahead, so one of the key trends to watch for and um, let me just say there is a lot going on with employment law, <laughs> so that will be an interesting webinar. And in January, we're going to talk about apprenticeships and how they can be a solution to your recruitment challenges, because we know recruitment is still difficult for many employers. And actually, um, young workers have probably struggled the hardest coming out from the pandemic. And obviously, apprenticeships aren't just for young workers, but obviously at all ages. Um, but apprenticeships are a good way of um, tackling any recruitment challenges. We also are running an additional webinar in January uh, to share our insights on how to manage the menopause in the workplace and how you can support employees. Um, you know, there's been some case rulings recently. There's been, uh, we've had Menopause Awareness Month. Um, it's obviously a, a really important topic that should be talked about to help uh, share in the understanding of um, what people experience. So we're running that at the end of January. And then in February, our Hot Topic and Webinar is all about performance management but at all levels within your organization, not just at, at one level. March, we're gonna be looking at how um, you deal with sickness absence and why we're seeing an ever-increasing need to support long-term sickness. So that's gonna be the March topic. And as usual, you'll be running our annual uh, virtual employment law seminar. So that will be on the 28th of March. You can sign up for it now. It's a couple of hours. And as I said a moment ago, there's lots coming up in terms of employment law. Um, and we'll be going through all of that and the latest HR best practice in case rulings in those two hours. So uh, do join us for that. A final poll is more about um, our services and if you'd like to find out more about them then do let us know whether that's our HR services including the knowledge base, health and safety, recruitment, payroll, training, do let us know. Okay. Okay, over to you. Yeah, thank you. And that's really just to say thank you to everybody. We're a few minutes over 11, uh, but thank you for all the questions and taking part in the polls. Hope that's uh, been informative for you. And uh, thank you to Sue and uh, Rebecca um, supporting conversations and the technical challenges. So I hope to see you um, either at the end of November on our next webinar or the December one, but take care. Thank you, everybody.